Good morning, everybody. How are y'all doing today? Good to see you guys. Welcome. Uh, if this is your first time or your hundredth time, thanks for being here. Maybe you're watching online. Uh, we're just glad you're worshiping with us today. I did not say this first service, but but no one, like sometimes like I'm up here and it feels like you guys are really far away. And I know we have to set up the room so we can like not have heads in the camera shot and whatnot. But like nobody sits in these five chairs. So I think one day I'm just going to hide Chick-fil-A gift cards under them. Like, and if you sit there, like, like I'm going to come in next week. People are going to be looking under there. Who knows? There may be something. You got to sit there to find out. Um, <laughs> Uh, I am glad to see you guys today. We are um, in continuing our series, A Step Into the Story, where we're looking at, at some of our people's stories of faith um, and how God has moved through their lives, and we're looking at Scripture and how God is, is calling us to have a closer relationship to Him. And, and we've been in this series for several weeks now, and we're excited to jump into it today. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Luke chapter 18. If you texted the LH Notes link, there's actually a link you can click that should open uh, you to Luke chapter 18. Um, or if you have your phones or whatever, obviously we text in church. We tell you to text all the time. So like you could play a game, and I would never know. <laughs> it may be more entertaining. Um, but while you're doing that, I want to tell you guys a story about one of my favorite athletes of all time. How many of you guys know or have heard the name Roger Bannister? So Dr. Roger Bannister, right? Doug, right? a couple of us, right? If you've never heard of Roger Bannister, do yourself a favor and Google it. Uh, Roger Bannister, Dr. Roger Bannister uh, is an incredible man. He accomplished insane, unbelievable things. The greatest of which, in my opinion, is he is the first man to run a mile in under four minutes. Uh, he broke the barrier. In fact, at one point in time, they thought that a four-minute mile wasn't physically possible. Now high school kids are doing it. But before a high school kid ever did it, Roger Bannister did it. And during kind of the race to break the four-minute mile, Roger Bannister, uh, his, his biggest competition were these two guys. One of them was named um, John, I just lost his name for a second. Landy, John Landy, and the other is Wes Santee. John Landy was Australian, and Wes Santee is from America, right? And these three guys were in these competitions, in, in each independently trying to break this barrier. But Roger Bannister was the first man to do it at Oxford. Well, first man to do it, he did it at Oxford, as a well-placed Oxford comic would tell us. Um, actually, that's not the usage of an Oxford comma, and I know that, so please don't send me emails later. I really appreciate that. Uh, but he is the first person to do it. And quickly after Bannister broke the four-minute mile, John Landy did the same in Melbourne, Australia. And so because, you know, if two guys are doing this in separate places, the obvious answer to figure out who the fastest man in the world is is to have them race. That's exactly what they did. The two men raced against each other in the mile to see how, who between the two sub four minute milers was going to be the fastest. In fact, the race is referred to as the perfect mile. There's a great book by the same, by the same name that uh, you can pick up, and I would highly encourage you to read it. But in this race, right, you have these two men who have very different running styles. You have John Landy, the Australian, who his goal is when he, when he starts running, he sets a fast pace early, and he never backs away from it. But then you have Roger Bannister. And his, 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 his pace usually would be to set behind the leader right until the last quarter mile. And he would kick on the last turn of the last quarter mile and pass the competition. That's exactly what happened during this race. And on the very last turn, Landy, who knows about the Bannister famous kick, right, is turning to see where Bannister is. And there's a famous photo of him looking while Bannister is passing him on the right. Roger Bannister went on to win, uh, to win the race, was dubbed the world's fastest man. Both men finished in under four minutes. You know, who called it the perfect mile. Landy had ended up having an incredible career. He went to the Olympics again, and uh, his is a great story in and of itself. Um, and I would encourage you to look up both of them. But, but Bannister, right, he, he held something back. And at the right moment, he gave everything he had to win the race. Some of us take that same Bannister approach to our lives, right? There are things that we hold back for certain times or certain seasons. I have my grandfather's pocket watch that I'm holding back and one day will give to my son. Not pocket, I said pocket watch, pocket knife. Um, that one day I will give to my son as a generational gift between my, my, my grandfather to me to my son. I have my great-grandfather's wristwatch. 
And I will one day give that to one of my other sons as a generational gift. I'm holding those back for the right time and the right season. Anybody grew up having that rainy day fund, right? For us, maybe it was the same for you. It was a glass jar on the refrigerator because it's harder for you to, I guess, reach into the top of the glass jar on the refrigerator. And I'm not sure why it was called a rainy day fund. I'm sure the etymology of that is fascinating, but it's like, why when it's raining outside are we going to spend all this money when we should just stay inside? Right? The rainy day fund, right? It, it's what we hold back just in case. I think the, the, the holding back for certain times and certain seasons and certain areas is great, but the problem is, is what happens when we hold back in an area that we're supposed to give our all? What would it look like if Bannister, instead of holding back enough to kick at the end of that race, didn't? And he crossed the finish line still holding back. You know what would have happened? He'd have been the second fastest man in the world. Because at the time, when it's time to give your all, you've got to give your all. The problem I see, church, is for us that sometimes we hold back when we're supposed to give God our all. And for us, it sh- for each of us, it shows up in different areas, but, but for times in our lives, there's things where we, we say, yes, Jesus, you're my Savior, and we're great with him being our Savior, but when we're told that he has to be our Lord of all of our lives, it's like, okay, well, you can have, you know, nine-tenths of my life, but this one-tenth over here, this little corner of my heart, that's for me. The sin area that I don't really want to give up, this pride area, that I don't want to give up. Jesus encountered somebody like this in Luke chapter 18. When he, when he has a rich young ruler come to him, right? And this is the conversation between Jesus and this ruler. Verse 18, it says, And a ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God. Which is like foreshadowing, like that's because I'm God, right? I also love how Jesus answers questions. And it's maddening. I think I would have like just pulled my hair out if I was trying to have a conversation with Jesus. Because it's like, Jesus, what do I do about this? Well, you say, what do I do about this? But have you ever thought, what about this? And you're like, well, that's not what I asked you, Jesus. And Jesus has a way of redirecting the question to the right question. Sometimes we ask God a question, even in prayer. This is not what the sermon is about today. But sometimes we pray and ask God something when we need to allow him to redirect our hearts to be asking something else. Jesus was a master at the redirection question. I would love to be able to have conversations like Jesus did. It's like, I don't know about you, but the argument that I have in my home is, Joel, what are we having for dinner? Hmm, what are we having for dinner? Have you thought about what we're going to have for dessert? So you redirect it to the more important thing, right? (laughs) That's what Jesus is doing here. He redirects the question. Why do you call me good? No one is good except God. He said, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, all these things I have kept from my youth. And Jesus said, and and when Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack, sell all that you have, distribute to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven, and come and follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad. Because he was extremely rich. So Jesus is saying, hey, like, you know, he basically spells out the Ten Commandments. He goes, well, you know what the Bible says. You know what the law says. Do these things. And the guy's like, I've done that. What else? And Jesus says, okay, you want to know what it's going to take to have eternal life? You, wanna, you really want to know? Sell everything. Give it all to the poor. Give to those who don't have what you have. And then instead of possessing those things, follow me. Follow me. Give everything away so you can follow me. What Jesus is saying in the moment isn't a a, a statement about money as much as it's a statement about what the man was holding back. Don't hold anything back. Follow me. I find this story actually pretty heartbreaking. Because the man, instead of saying, yes, okay, and following Jesus, he became sad because of how wealthy he was. And when asked to give everything away for the sake of Jesus, the rich young ruler wanted to hold something back. Here's the truth, guys. I'm no different. 
it's not necessarily wealth. I don't have much of that to hold back. But sometimes it's my pride that I don't want to give over to Jesus and I want to hold on to the things that are about me. Sometimes it's even my family. And it's something we talked about earlier in the year with Abraham sacrificing his son. And, and when Jesus says, are you really lo- willing to love me this much? It's yes, I love you this much, but my kids, I need to make sure that I can do what they need. But am I holding on to them to the point where I'm not fully following Jesus with all of my heart? The truth is each of us have an area in our lives that we like to hold back, that we like to hold on to, that we don't want to fully give. And it could be different for each of us. Maybe it's that sin that you can't get over and you try and you try and you try. You just feel trapped in it. And here's the truth. You feel like that sin is what's really keeping you from following Jesus wholeheartedly like you should be. But you're so afraid to tell anyone that instead of giving that sin over to Jesus, you hold on to it and you keep it secret and you try to hide it. Or maybe it's not sin. Maybe for you it's pride. Maybe it's your families. Maybe it's something that seems good on the surface, but it's keeping you from following Jesus with all that you have. You see, trusting God without holding back produces the kind of faith Jesus desires for us. the type of faith that I want. It's the type of faith I want for you. But it begins with us asking ourselves the question, what am I holding back? The story of the rich young ruler continues. And in verse 24, it says, Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. It's a hard statement. How difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who have heard it said, then those who heard it said, then who can be saved? But he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Do you know how big a camel is? Anybody ever seen a camel or ridden on a camel? Yeah, they're real big. In my mind, sometimes I think a camel is just like a bumpy horse, right? They are significantly larger than horses. There was a day several, I say several years ago, when I was a child, uh, this like traveling, like oversized petting zoo, I don't know what it was, was in a mall parking lot, and there were elephants and camels that you could ride. So my mom took us and paid money, and I sat on the back of a camel and walked around a mall parking lot. I say mall. I think it was a Walmart. <laughs> that makes a little more sense. Walked around a Walmart parking lot, right? Camels are enormous. They're huge. They're more like elephant horses than horses, right? They're, they're giant. So we've established that camels are huge. How big is the eye of a needle? Not big. Not the size of an elephant horse. Right? Some scholars will say that when Jesus talks about the, the, the eye of the needle, that he's referring to a specific gate in the walls leading into Jerusalem that was a very narrow gate that a camel couldn't fit through. Right? I'm not sure why we argue over this, because some scholars say, yes, it's definitely this gate. Others say, no, that's not what he was talking about. He was actually talking about a sewing needle. But it doesn't matter, because the point that Jesus is making isn't, hey, guys, argue about something that's not important. What he's making is a very big thing can't fit through a very small thing. It is impossible. Right? I have synthesized all of the Greek for you in that moment. Something big can't go through something small. It's impossible. That's Jesus' point. But he says, what is impossible with man is possible with God. What is impossible for man is possible for God. There's 
a lot of things that I've tried and I'm not very good at. You ever have something that you just keep working at and keep working at and keep working at and it, you can never resolve it? It seems impossible. That's why I hate glitter. <laughs> I'm joking. You may be like a glitter person. I am not a glitter person. Several years ago, I was working in student ministry, and I had a leader at the time named Casey who loved to play pranks. I'm also not a prank person. Like, I just don't think it's very fun. And her idea of a prank this particular day was to convince three students to have a handful of glitter and to each run up to me and throw it at me, which is a terrible prank. My mouth was open for one of them. And look, it was a Wednesday night. I've been chasing middle school kids around, so I'm slightly sweaty. And like glitter sticks to that. And I have a beard, and it sticks to that. And I remember I went into the bathroom. I was so mad. And I go into the bathroom trying to get all this glitter off, and I'm washing, like literally getting hand soap and washing my face to try to get all this glitter off. It's not coming off. That night I went home. Again, I showered, tried to get glitter off, and I got most of it off. But here's the thing. No matter how many hours you spend trying to get glitter off of yourself, it does not all come off. The next day, there was still glitter. The next week, there was still glitter. I know this because we live stream our services or in, in students, and the light hit my face in a certain way, and you could see my beard sparkling hate glitter no matter how hard i tried and i'd pick it out and pick it out i would in fact i am pretty certain it's somewhere on my face there is still glitter today you're looking at me now <laughs> it's impossible to get all the glitter off no matter how hard we try and i know that's a silly example but sometimes there's those things in our lives that we try again and again and again and again and again to give over to God, and we can't. And Jesus' point is, what is impossible for man is possible for God. And maybe you're frustrated, maybe you're discouraged, maybe you're, 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 it's not, you're frustrated or discouraged, you're shameful about it. It's, it's a secret for you, and you hate it. And you hate that you can't be as close to God as you want to be. And it feels impossible to give to God what you're holding back. Jesus also made the point that the reason that the ruler couldn't give back because of his wealth, right? He said it's easier for or it is difficult for the wealthy to get into heaven. That's crazy. What is it about that? You know what I think he's talking about? I don't think he's actually talking about finances. I think he's talking about comfort. What would happen if God asked us to give up our comfort? Because most of us are great following Jesus until it kind of becomes difficult. Until it asks us to step outside of our comfort zone and do something we don't want to do. We're great with going to church until football season. Because then we're uncomfortable because, you know what? Our comfort zone is the Denver Broncos. We're great with following Jesus until he asks us to tithe. It's like, oh, I want to hold on to that. I, I need my rainy day fund. I'm comfortable with that. We're unwilling to step outside of our comfort we're great with following Jesus when it's convenient for us. But when it becomes uncomfortable, it becomes more difficult, and it's so much easier to hold on to our comfort. And what Jesus is saying is, even if that's difficult for you to give up, that's okay. Because what's impossible for man is possible for God. Maybe you're sitting here going, man, I I've tried again and again and again, and I go to church, but being that close to God is impossible for me. I'm here to tell you today it's not. It's not impossible. Last week we talked about this idea of preparing our hearts to receive. And sometimes the way we prepare our hearts to receive is we give all of what's in our heart to Jesus. And sometimes we can't even do that. And we've got to ask God to come in and take out what's already there. We have to give up those comforts. We have to lean in. can 
follow God with all of our hearts. You see, when Jesus asks to be the Lord of our lives, it requires us to carefully look at what we want to hold back and ask ourselves, why? Why am I holding this back? Is it because of shame? Is it because of comfort? Is it because it's impossible? It feels impossible for us to give it to God. Because this is what Jesus says. What is impossible for man is possible for God. And I'm here to tell you this morning, there's a way. There's a way to give it all. There's a way to not hold back. But the first part of that is we've got to figure out, what are we holding back? What does it look like when there's nothing else left to hold back? What can God do in us and through us when that happens? This morning, I'm I'm really excited to share a a testimony of what happens in that very situation with Chris. Uh, But it was not something that was, religion was not really practiced in my home. I was woken one day uh, by my dad. And he said, get up, I found the Lord. I was like, I don't, I didn't realize we were looking for him. Um, So from 14 on, I knew that there was something greater and I was truly being introduced to God. Um, So it's slowly grown over my lifetime. Um, And, you know, today is obviously a huge part of my life. I would say that I've always kind of known Jesus. Um, My dad's side of the family is Catholic and Mormon, so I grew up going to Catholic school um, and Mormon like Sunday school um, for four hours every single Sunday. That was kind of my life. Um, So I've kind of always known about Jesus, always went to church. When I truly found God really was when Taylor got cancer. She had cancer of the blood, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. She was two and a half, and I lost literally everything in an instant. My marriage immediately fell apart, and so I chose to live inside the children's hospital with Taylor full time. Through the process, um, my family sold articles so I could I keep my car and my cell phone and just the basic items I knew I would need to start my life over. My father did end up becoming a pastor. He had a homeless shelter in San Antonio, Texas. And so one day he came up to the hospital. They were asking me, hey, what can we do? Is there anything you know, I can pray for? And at the time, uh, her doctor, Dr. Wells, had come in and said, Taylor was finally well enough to where we could leave the hospital. So I told my dad, this is what's going on. I don't have a place to live. He was there with a gentleman named Bear, and they were talking to me. And he said, you know, you really don't need to worry about this because God is going to provide. And I, I lost my mind. I was like, that guy doesn't work that way. This isn't how any of this works. Bear went back to the homeless shelter and told everybody there, that uh, Sister Amber was in need, and they went out and they panhandled and got me my first and last month on an apartment. So in that instance, I realized that not only had I lost everything through the process of Taylor having cancer, but I also lost my faith. And truly that crate of change, those dollar bills, renewed my faith in God. He definitely opened my eyes to a life that I could have never had any other way and opened my heart and my life to inviting others in to the miracles that are possible if you do put your faith in God. And I have never lost my faith since. And it's I've had a bumpy road since then with other things that have happened in my life. But at the back of my mind, I'm like, the good Lord will provide. He's shown me before in the craziest of times that it is absolutely possible. So I continue to have faith in him no matter what. I would say that I had my huge God moment when I was probably 10. The church that we were going to was really great and it was a good church for us to get connected into and they were having like a winter retreat. My mom 
kept pushing me and asking me to go just because I was a youth my age, because I did not like making new friends. And so I just decided, you know what, I'm going to do this just to make mom happy. I'm going to go. I'm going to hang out with these people and just give it a shot. On the second day there, they were doing, like, altar calls. And I experienced a very real God moment where God was like, hey, you're, you may feel lonely in the season of just moving and getting ready to pick up and start a new season, but I want you to know that I'm here with you, and I love you, and I'm, I'm here to walk with you, and I'm ready to do this. And so I went up to the front, and I told them I want to be, you know, a follower of Christ, and so I gave my life to Christ, and then less than three months later, I got baptized at that same church. I hear a lot when I just encounter people, you must be an amazing Christian, and you're so amazing, and the truth is, I am, I'm a sinner, Um, I struggle with everything that everyone around me struggles with. A lot of people who grow up in the church um, or even don't grow up in the church will experience the ups and the downs, the highs and the lows because it's just a natural part of a faith journey, I personally feel like. Mm -hmm. So I've experienced a lot of lows um, in the last four years, but I also have seen God's faithfulness to provide ever since. I've decided to say, yes, God, here I am. Send me. I will go where you want me to go. I love you so much. I love you. So he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. So sometimes it seems like we're in a position where we don't have any other choice option at that point isn't to hold back, but to give up. In contrast to the young ruler, Peter, the disciple of Jesus, he kind of a little bit self-promotes in verse 28. But he says, so we have left our homes, so we have left our homes and followed you. This is what Jesus says to him. Truly, truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brother or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. What Jesus is saying is that we stop reserving areas of our lives and we open our hearts. We open it to the transforming work of Christ. He can do more than we could ever imagine. If I have homeless panhandlers, pay for the homeless somehow. Or for a lost faith to be regained and then a generational faith to be applied there. That's what it takes giving Jesus everything. Mark 12, there's a story where Jesus is with his disciples, and they're in the temple, and they're looking at the, the money bin, wh- where the money's collected in the temple. And this is what it says in Mark 12, verse 41. It says, and he sat opposite of the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. And many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins to make a penny. He said to his disciples to him, or he said, and he called his disciples to him and said to them, truly I say to you, this poor woman has put in more than all those who were contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance or their comfort. But she put her poverty, has put everything she had and all she had to live on. The story draws a stark comparison between this woman who gave a little but gave everything. And so those who were comfortable, who gave a lot, gave nothing. And I'm sure that the the wealthy who were putting in the offering box were doing it with good intentions. They They weren't doing it to be bad or mean. 
and was well within their comfort. The faith of the widow was greater than the faith of the wealthy. But the actions of the widow were also greater than the actions of the wealthy. Because what she did was hold nothing back and trusted God for the outcome. She didn't have another choice but to trust God. She gave God everything. She didn't try to cross the finish line with some left in the tank. She gave it all and trusted him. Here's my question for you today. How do we live like that? We can trust God with everything. I'm not saying go and cash in your 401ks and turn your liquid, make your savings liquid and give it all away. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is find the way to do that for your heart. Give it all to Jesus. That's going to be different for you than it is going to be for me. So the question I want to leave you with today, and I want to pray about for just a few minutes today, is this one. Why is, what is holding you back from fully trusting God? What is holding you back from fully trusting God? What is it for you? Because I know what God is doing in my heart. And I'll tell you, it's not fun. But I think it's going to be worth it.